morning, everybody. I'm sure I'm sure we'll still have uh, more people joining us um, as this goes along. Uh, I'm Ed Coburn with Cabot Wealth Network, um, and I'll be moderating today. Uh, first, I want to thank you um, for you know signing up and joining this this renewed event. Um, I think pretty much everybody's aware of this, but just in case, Renewed is a totally free open community. The, the, the beating heart of our community is a, is a Slack presence um, and uh, Slack threads and discussion that are, that are just phenomenal. Uh, so I encourage people to, to sign up for that if they haven't, and you can find information about us and how to, how to get on the Slack uh, workspace at join dash renewed r-e-n-e-w-d dot net uh, so you can go there and um, and learn more and get signed up uh, for the slack uh, for slack access um, that'd be great uh, so let me get started uh, i'm delighted to see everybody and I see Heather Farley looking exceptionally happy. Uh, I assume, I can only imagine that has something to do with look, giving Macy a hard time, we'll see. Um, so uh, I wanna introduce uh, today's panelists uh, for this impor important uh, topic of uh, diversity and inclusion uh, in our organizations and in our, within our industry. Uh, so I'm gonna start off by introducing Macy Fecto, who is the Executive Vice President and Chief People Officer at Access Intelligence, uh, one, of the, one of the larger companies in our community. Uh, I wanna introduce, uh, and, and, and Macy, can you just wave this, just so, yeah, thank you. And uh, I wanna introduce Mamta Patel, who is the director and co-founder of Chemical Watch. Uh, oh, uh, Monta, are you also in Shrewsbury? Is the, is the whole company in Shrewsbury? No, actually, I've always worked from home. So okay. I mean, that's quite pertinent to the discussion today, but I'll talk about it later, yeah. Okay, fair enough. So, but, but as you may guess, infer from the accent, Monta is, is based in the UK. Uh, and, and Dan Fink, who is the managing director of Money Media, a financial times company. So although Dan is based in New York and his company is based in New York, he has part of a foot in, in, in the UK as well when he uh, when travel is, is functioning, which of course <coughs> is not now. Um, so uh, we're gonna get started. Uh, I wanna mention that if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat, uh, chat channel there and uh, the chat box and we will try to get to them. Um, Stephanie has posted uh, a listing there also of our other upcoming events and you can always find that uh, we, we try to inform people by email uh, on the Slack channel and then also if you go to the website um, you, you also can find a listing of upcoming events. Um, but so if you have questions, feel free to ask them there. Otherwise, we, you know, we, we can, we've got plenty to talk about here. So let's get started. Um, and the, the way this is going to work, we, we're, I'm going to throw out some questions and the panelists will respond and, um, and we'll just take it from there. Um, first question, when people hear the word diversity, they tend to think gender and race, but there are many other dimensions of diversity. Um, you know, there's education, there's religion, there's gender identity, uh, there's sexual preference, there's physical abilities, geography, job title. You know, there, uh, there's actually uh, someone who's cataloged these and found 24 different dimensions of, of diversity. Um, what dimensions of diversity are you targeting with the efforts in your companies? Because some are certainly more prominent and probably more pressing than others. Uh, anybody, whoever would like to start? Yeah, I'll, go ahead, Macy. I'll start. Um, you know, I agree. And I, I heard a neuroscientist say once that, you know, diversity is when you have more than one people, one person in a room. So to your point, Ed, there are, there are way more types of people than what we generally focus on in, in the workplace. And for us at AI, um, we've been a little behind. We're 83% we're Caucasian. And so our main focus when we talk about diversity is really um, ethnicity and, and race. We do pretty well on gender. 
with over about 60% female and 50% of our executive management team being female. But the, the non-white people in our company are just so few that that is our main focus. And it's not that the other things don't matter, but I think we, we really can't get to a diverse place and start to practice inclusion until we are better at having a, a better representation of our population at Access Intelligence. So that's kind of our focus. Yep. Uh, and Mamta? Yeah, I would really echo what Macy says there. It's, it's, it's a difficult journey. I, I, I think Chemical Watch is pretty typical to that. It's um, mostly Caucasian, um, a few people from other ethnic minorities. Um, I happen to be director and co-founder, and I do wonder if I hadn't co-founded the business, would I be where I am? <laughs> so that's one way to get to the top, is to create your own. Um, yeah. it's, no, I mean, I think, all joking aside, I think we've got a really good culture at Chemical Watch. It, it's very inclusive, I would say. Um, but I think within that, there's a lot of let out, you know, for not actually examining this more carefully, measuring setting targets, you know, I think we're as guilty of those as anyone else, really. I think, you know, I mentioned earlier that I work from home. And one thing when I was looking at this question is what struck me that's unusual about our organization is that we have a lot of people working from home and we always have since the beginning. And I think that does, as we're all discovering during COVID, gives you a much greater sense of who a person is, what their home circumstances might be. You see them as more rounded people than you would otherwise. Um, and I think something that I certainly find true and, uh, and other people that I know from different races find true as, as well is that you often park part of yourself when you enter the office whereas when you're working from home that's not so easy to do you know so there is that but then you know we've also heard that during COVID the disparities have increased because you suddenly realize that people's home circumstances are not all on a par that they may have caring duties that are in fact increasing the divergences and so on so yeah, so there's a lot of issues to untangle in that one question. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Dan, what, what sort of diversity are you targeting with your efforts there? So, yeah, you know, uh, obviously diversity has many, many facets to it. Um, you know, and I think, you know, in an idealistic way, we're, we're attempting to address them all, you know, trying to be as open-minded and, and, and inclusive uh, to, for all elements of diversity. Uh, when we talk about when we talk internally about how uh, you know how we hire, how we promote, how we assess performance, we talk about how really a, a person's actual job performance and job qualifications are the only factors that should matter. Uh, and we, we you know one of the sort of sayings we have is that you know demographics shouldn't enter the equation. Period. Uh, it really isn't about demographics. It's it's really about the job, you know, performance and, and their qualifications. Uh, that said, you know, most of our efforts are based around gender and race. Those are the two sort of, I guess, most prominent or, or you know, most highest profile uh, elements of uh, diversity that are top of mind for the staff. You know, in, in a lot of ways, I'm, I'm trying to reflect, you know, the, the staff in, in terms of what their, their desire is and what the type of organization they want to work at. Um, but that said, you know, sexual identity and, and gender identity uh, have also been um, more more high profile in, in you know recent times, uh, and we're you know we're we're inclusive of of every every element of of diversity. I I, I will say, you know I don't want to sound negative in any way, but there's this there's sometimes what we've seen is that people will say oh there's a diversity of thought you know maybe we have 50 people that all look exactly alike but they have, they think very differently so we have diversity. And I think we've been careful to say, well, that doesn't really represent diversity for us. You know, we are we are specifically looking for diversity in terms of, of gender and ethnicity um, and, and other you know sort of demographic elements. Um, but diversity of thought is critically important. Uh, you know, I think one of the ways we get there is by having a diverse group of people. Well, and the, you know, when I hear diversity of thought, you, I mean, you get you get uh, you know a room full of, of 50 old white guys with, like me uh, and, and we've got diversity of thought from here to here you you get, you fill that room with a truly diverse and inclusive room and your diversity of thought now goes to here and you're coming up with better products and I think that's the 
that's the point that, that, that I think is important. One thing that I, I, I had intended to say right up front, when I think, thinking about diversity, diversity is, uh, uh, I once saw a quote, diversity is about having the right mix and inclusion is about making that mix work. Um, so uh, I, you know, I was glad to hear Macy when you said 50% of the executive 60% of the company is women, 50% of the executive team is women, because we so often see, yes, our company is diverse, but all the people of color are in the bottom three layers of the organization, and all the women are in the you know lower half of the organization or whatever, and you get up to the top and it's, it's white males or whatever. So, um, you know, that, I, we, we, we would call that a diverse environment, but not an inclusive environment necessarily. And it's, so it's nice to hear that, uh, you know, what, what you're talking about. So I, I'd love to hear what, what your thinking has been the most successful in your organization uh, and, you know, in, in helping foster diversity and inclusiveness, uh, you know, two, one, two or three things that you've done that have really, uh, you know, may, had a, had a very positive impact. Uh, anybody? Uh, yeah, I, go ahead, Dan. I can start this one uh, since I, I had the benefit of going last uh, in the prior question. Uh, you know, I think the deliberate steps that we took to attract a more diverse uh, candidate pool for our jobs uh, that 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 we the steps we were still taking in that area have probably been the most you know the single most effective. Um, process, process change that we've implemented. You know, we weren't getting diverse candidate pools and our staff demographics reflected that. Um, and as our candidate pools have improved, so has our hiring. Uh, you know, you know, and I, I wouldn't say that that was the only issue, but that, you know, in terms of what, what has been successful in, in moving the meter, uh, that has absolutely been uh, very successful. Probably the most successful thing that we've done to move the meter for, to help us bring in more diverse people into the organization. You know, I'd also say that, um, you know, and I, I don't think I fully understood this in the beginning, and I, I also don't want to hold myself out as an expert by any means, because I'm, I'm still learning and I have a lot left to learn on this topic. But one of the things I've learned along the way is that, um, you know, they say tone is set at the top, and, and uh, by, by me talking about diversity and inclusion, by me bringing it up more than just once, you know, but multiple times, over the course of, of time and, and really being a champion and a visible champion of this uh, topic that that has set the tone and has set expectations that people you know have said all right wow this is this is real and this is important and we need to make sure we're we're doing this um, i can't i can't do it all there's there's 140 people in the money media organization i i need everybody to you know participate but you know one of the key things that i think has been effective more effective than i realized up front would be you know, setting the tone uh, and how much that would make a difference. Yep, yep. Th thank you. That's that's a that's a great point. And I, uh, the, I remember uh, seeing a statistic about um, that uh, a, a survey done by McKinsey, where uh, eighty percent of CEOs felt they were they were talking the the talk at least on diversity. Uh, but only 50% of the employees within those companies felt the CEO was was talking the talk, let alone walking the walk. So, you know, that's something where, uh, you know, it's incumbent on wh whatever level you are in the organization. Um, you know, I, I, I see a statistic like that and I think we're not as good as we think we are. And so keep working on it. I happen to know, Dan, you work on this. So I'm not I'm not trying to well, no, that, poke, that's, poke fun that's at you. Good. That's a very good point, Ed. And I think earlier in, in the in the process, I, I started working, you know, sort of proactively and, and consciously on diversity about three years ago. Uh, and I think in the beginning, for the, at least for the first year, I thought I was definitely in that category where I thought like, I'm, I'm talking about this, you know, we're doing this. And it became apparent to me that I'm not doing enough. I think I'm doing enough, but I'm not doing enough. And, uh, you know, and, and I sort of had had that realization and you know, spend time figuring out, you know, what is it that I need to do to make this clearer and, and, to, and to, to be, you know, to truly be a champion of, of diversity. You know, interestingly, one of the reporters in, uh, in the Money Media Organization did a podcast with uh, John Robbins. I think that's his name, John Robbins. Uh, he's founder of Ariel Investments. Uh, he's on the board directors at Nike and McDonald's and, and a, a 
couple of other companies. Uh, and he talked about, you know, what it meant to be, um, you know, a, a champion of diversity. And, uh, you know, I, I listened to that and, I, and that was one of the things that sort of made me re reflect, like, am I, am I really doing what I need to do or do I think I'm doing it? Um, so, uh, you know, yeah, like I said before, I'm, I'm, I'm no expert and I'm learning every day, but that's definitely one of the things uh, I, uh, one, of the, one of the lessons I learned along the way. Yeah. Um, Mom, Tara, Macy. Yeah, go ahead, Macy. I was just going to say that if you look for three things, the first thing I did was realize that I, I didn't know enough about these topics. Like Dan, you think you do, you think you're doing all the right things. So I, eight weeks ago, enrolled in a program at Cornell on diversity and inclusion, which if anybody's focused on this, I highly recommend. It was, it was really enlightening for me. Um, and it also gave me a lot of pointers and tools to use in our company. So I just finished, we'll, we'll be making use of those. The second thing I did was set up a diversity and inclusion committee at our company made up of volunteers. And we're not a, a large company, we have 180 employees, but we had 14 volunteers. And much like the makeup of our employee population, a lot of them were white, but we do have some representation from people of color. But interestingly, I started the first meeting by really asking people what their interest was and why they wanted to be a part of it. And almost every single person had biracial children or you know, one, one kid had grown up Jewish in a town that had no other Jewish people and she remembered being bullied as a child. Like just, you just don't know by looking at somebody what they're bringing to the table. And so having that, that um, diversity and inclusion committee has been very helpful. And the, the last thing, I mean, there's lots of things, but just to highlight a third, um, I, I'm on the board of directors for our company and somewhere along the line had stopped recording statistics on um, race and gender and all of those things. Our board meetings had just become, you know, I, I try to keep my comments on the people and culture stuff to the really relevant things or, or somewhat to a minimum in terms of only how they affect the business. And it occurred to me that, you know, our numbers were A, worse than I thought they were in terms of the number of people of color we employ. And two, that I hadn't noticed it because I'm not reporting on it. So again, kind of similar to your point, Dan, you have to, you have to bring it out into the open and talk about it and make, make goals around these things. And I think that will help. Yeah, well, I, and that's sort of the old, you, in business, in, in life, you get what you measure. And, uh, you know, if you're not measuring it and looking at that data, it, it tends to, you know, we only have so much attention. Um, uh, Mamta. Ed, so I was just going to say that at Chemical Watch, I think one of the most useful things we did was have diversity training for all of our management team in-house. Um, and that really got them all discussing things together. They then talk to our deputy management team, which is, you know, is, is very infused by this issue. They all want to build the company that they want to work for. So, you know, they've got a very exciting project coming along. So that those things have worked really well, I think. I mean, it has helped to have um, a role model on the board because it means that it gives everyone the sense that they can get there too, you know, which is, it's as simple as that, you know, however that actually worked, it, it's, it's a good thing to have. And I think if you don't have that um, on at senior level, that can be a lot harder. Um, we are looking at bringing in metrics around this, but one of my worries is that representation is one thing. You can measure how many people you've got of, of colour or any other um, diversities that you want to measure. But the other, it, it's very different to actually being an inclusive culture. You know, it's not just having the numbers doesn't mean that you're doing it right. And, and also, as we all know, looking at metrics again and again gets stale. And you've got to find a way to understand how that it transforms the company. So it, it's just bringing up that thinking, which comes from a nonprofit that I'm working with, where we're just seeing that it, it's about looking, it's about um, people who are not of color or not of any of those different diversities, having an open mind, having empathy with anyone who might be different to themselves, um, being willing to re-examine their own identities in, in the mix, um, doing some reverse mentoring, actually listening to people rather than 
saying this is what we're doing for you. You know, it's all those things that they're, they're now looking at that whole mix of ideas. Hmm. Mm. Yeah. Um, and and uh, just to echo something, M Macy, your note on that, that Cornell program, I haven't done that yet, but I see it a lot. It's very well regarded. And uh, so I, I, I haven't yet taken the time to do it, but but it's been on my list. And um, I, I've, I've heard very, very positive things about that from people I know in the in the diversity and inclusion community. Um, uh, so um, I, I wanted to follow up on something. Uh, I mean, I know Dan referred to it, and it was something that I thought was important. And I saw uh, Elizabeth Peterson had asked about it as well. Um, some recruiting channels are used by s certain communities, and uh, so, so Dan, you mentioned you know basically you you started fishing in other ponds for for job candidates. How did how did you do that? I th I think this is a this is a big barrier that we you know used to be monster. Now it's now it's Indeed or you know other things, but. And, but even LinkedIn, I mean, you look at the demographics of he, who uses those platforms, they skew white, they skew male, uh, for the most part, you know, some of them skew a little bit one way or the other, but uh, so it's sort of the big mainstream places you think about. So, so what, what have you been doing to find candidates, to recruit candidates from, from diverse communities? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I, and you and I actually had a conversation a, a couple of years back where I was saying, really, Link, everybody's not on LinkedIn? That's that's not a diverse place. Isn't everybody there? Uh, but you learn reasonably quickly when you start paying attention and looking at it, that LinkedIn is not a diverse source of candidates. And uh, you're, you're, you're just not gonna get uh, diversity from LinkedIn. Uh, and, you know, I think this is still a challenge that we, we struggle with to some degree, but we have definitely um, found some good success. It, almost all um, minority groups have some sort of association. You know, we, we advertise all, you know, almost all of our journalism jobs with the National Association of Black Journalists. There's a National Association of Hispanic Journalists. We have uh, actually right now we're in the process of setting up an internship program for the coming year with two uh, HBCUs. Uh, there are also our, we, you know, we have a, an internal recruiter as part of the FT group that Money Media works with. And, and you know, I know not all companies have that, that benefit, but, you know, we've worked with her to identify uh, a lot of local colleges and universities in the New York City area that serve just a very diverse set of, of underrepresented um, students that we can recruit from. Uh, we also launched an internship program uh, that was targeted, you know, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't specified that you had to be a minority to be in the internship program, but it was targeted at minority communities and that, um, you know, interestingly, that helped us bring in some really talented young folks. Uh, the problem was at the end of the internship, we, we didn't have a, a permanent job that we could offer them. Uh, you know, Money Media is, you know, I don't know what you call it, sort of medium sized, but at our size, we really don't hire very, it's very rare that we hire a college grad that doesn't have at least one or two years of practical business experience, either, you know, writing articles at a local newspaper or, or something, um, you know, doing marketing somewhere, doing sales somewhere. We, we usually require at least one or two years of experience. So, you know, that was one of the gaps for, from last year that we, we realized exists. And so for, uh, for 2021, for next year, what we're launching is an apprenticeship program, which is meant to bridge that gap where, you know, the interns that perform the best, we're gonna move them into this, we're gonna offer them, hopefully they'll, they'll accept it, uh, a spot, we have two spots for apprentices where they'll essentially spend a year in a full, you know, full salary, full-time position. It's a one-year program and they'll work with, you know, if they're journalists, they'll work with multiple editors. If they're on the commercial or business side, they'll work with, you know, sales and marketing and operations groups. Uh, and the goal is that in the last three months of that internship program, will place them into permanent roles, so long as they performed well, um, and as long as they, that they're interested in staying with us. Uh, but this program is specifically meant to bridge the gap. You know, we, we did this internship program, but we just didn't have any positions for them, even though we had open positions. Uh, so, you know, our, our goal is to move two of the interns into these apprentice roles and then move them into full-time positions at the end of that year. And that opens up two more spots for new apprentices. And if we can do that each year, 
uh, we help we help build our pipeline. So, you know, we're really getting creative. You know, the last thing I'll say on this, I know I'm, I don't want to hog up the microphone, but one of the things that hit me was I, I was talking to one of our um, long tenured uh, black journalists and employees at Money Media, and I was saying, you know, well, I'll leave his name out for the for, for sensitive sensitivity reasons, but I was like, you know, hey, I was like, you know, we're really struggling. We just don't get enough. Uh, you know, black applicants. We don't get enough, you know, applicant minority applicants at all, and we're, we're we're trying so hard. And he said, you know, he's like, look, Dan, they're out there, but they just aren't likely to apply to a company like Money Media and the FT Group. That's not where, you know, culturally, you know, their whole lives, they've never thought that's a place that I'm, you know, likely to work. So when the job posting, you know, goes past them, they're, they're just not likely to apply. And I was like, well, so so what do we do? What do I do, Tony? You know, I said, you know, we need more minority candidates. We need more diverse candidate pools. You know, we've made progress, but we're not there yet. What do I do? And he said, you know, look, if if you're not getting the candidates to come to you, you've got to go out and get them. And I was like, yep. really? It's my job to go out and get them? Okay. So if that's my job, I, how do I do that? I don't even know how I do that. Um, so I, I won't go any deeper than that. But that was a bit of a, a you know. A, a milestone for me to sort of recognize like it to some degree like society is set up where they're you know these minority candidates are just not going to apply to my jobs and if I want to bring them in I'm going to have to go out and get them you know whatever that means there's a number of different sort of processes for that but I'm going to have to go out and get them and and I that's a really good point and I, I will get to Mamta and, and Macy on uh, on the same question of you know recruiting but but on that point you know if we wanted to if you wanted if, if any of us wanted to develop a new line of business if it was strategically important for us to to develop a new line of business or a new product line or an acquisition or whatever the the you know the, those of us at the top wouldn't hesitate to think of course I need to be proactive and engage with that. And, but because we're used to hiring in an automatic way and producing certain results, we just think, oh, that just happens. But if it's strategically important for us to hire in a different way, we have to engage with it like we're starting a new product line. And it, it means senior executive engagement. I mean, it goes back to the point you were making earlier, Dan, that I think is, is really important. Um, uh, so I'll shut up and uh, pass that on to Manta or, or Macy or, yes, to add how you recruit. Yeah, sure. I'd like to say, John, I think, you know, apprenticeships are a really great idea. They've worked for us as well, um, quite well in Shrewsbury and places. You know, I think it, it's the way of reaching out to those who haven't perhaps come back, come up through your own educational routes. It's about reaching out to the local community. And I think that that is really important here to you do have to go out if people aren't applying and we found the same thing people aren't applying we have very white candidate pools we've gone out to our recruitment agents we tend to work through agents and said this is your problem too do something about this we don't want to keep seeing all white shortlists you know and, and you can insist on not ever having an all white shortlist for example or an all male shortlist um it, it's also you know built into various metrics for some of our key people but I think at the end of the day, what we're all realizing is that it isn't easy and, and it's a cultural, it, it's to do with culture that goes way beyond your own organization. And you do have to work that hard to get there. And it does mean looking, you know, the way I, I look at it is looking in the mirror and seeing how your community sees you and seeing, you know, just asking, are you reflective of the community you live in? And I don't mean perhaps just the, the, the company, the village, the sector, I mean, the state that you live in, you know, look at the demographics of the working age population. Are you at all representative of that? If not, there's, there's work to be done there, you know, to reach those candidates as they're leaving college or even at school, you know, and then mentoring people through. That's that's what we've realized is it is that hard. And we don't have perhaps, as Dan was saying, in, in the US, you have those associations of different ethnicities. We don't have that so much here. So we're going to have to work even harder, I think, to get there. So, mm. yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, Jen Schwartz just mentioned in the chat, if you didn't see it, that also, you know, our recruitment pr process, things like tests, you know, much like the SATs are, you know, have been found to be, you know, in intrinsically biased. We, we need to look at the whole recruiting and onboarding process to see where are we messaging people 
that this is for you or this is not for you. And, you know, where, where are we consciously and unconsciously doing that? And uh, I'm assuming people on this call, it's, it's mostly at least unconscious, but let's not pretend we're not sending unconscious signals because I'm, I'm sure we are. Um, Macy, on the topic of recruiting. Yeah, I'll just add a couple. We've also tried the Association of Black and Hispanic Journalists for advertising and, and just some others if people are interested. Blackjobs.com has produced quite a number of candidates for marketing roles. Um, Diversity.com is another. Um, Journalismnext.com for African-American journalists also. Um, but to the earlier points made on LinkedIn being you know, that, that pool that's just predominantly white. And I've used that as our main recruiting tool for a number of years. Even indeed.com is found to be better than LinkedIn for diversity. But the other thing that works against us, and it's something we've been proud of, is over 50% of our new hires come from employee referrals. And when your, your current population is so homogenous, and then you bonus people to bring in their friends or people they might recommend, you're, you're doing nothing to diversify that pool. So one of the things we're considering is how, how to still take advantage of the fact that people like working at our company and are proud of it and wanna bring people in and balance that with gaining more diversity. And so some of the things we're looking at, to your point, Jen Schwartz, is doing away with the cognitive ability test that I currently give all applicants. Um, I happen to use the Wonderlic, but I think all cognitive ability tests have had some criticism as uh, in terms of being biased. So that's one thing, taking, taking names off resumes for hiring managers, to your point, Ed, no, nobody's consciously biased, but they're, they're, we all carry with us unconscious bias. So we are trying, our HR team is very focused on this and um, trying to do everything we can to, to present candidates on that short list that are from historically marginalized groups of one sort or another. And um, AI does have, we do have a corporate internship program that we call Media Associates. And, and it's almost a combination of what you described, Dan, in terms of internship and apprenticeship. We do it all in one year where candidates or um, the associates rotate through four areas of our company. And at the end, we, we do give them a job um, because they, at that point, they're pretty desirable to our hiring managers. And we've, for the last couple of years, like, I think the last three, one third of those people have been a person of color, but we are, you know, pre-pandemic, we plan to start, um, using Howard University's job fair and some other HBCUs to increase the diversity in those media associates because those are pretty highly sought after in, in our company. And you know, I, I did a, a look back and may have been no surprise to anyone predominantly white. So a lot of things we're, we're doing that are frankly newer to us to try to, to, try to diversify this the candidates we're putting in front of hiring managers. And it's extra hard when, you know, you're sort of dealing with expense cuts and a hiring freeze, but, but our, our efforts are more renewed than ever on this. And, and you raised, I mean, the idea of, of bonusing employees to bring in friends, which has proven to be remarkably successful historically as a way to bring in people who are committed and that sort of thing. Uh, you know, this, this you're sort of balancing needs here, um, and you don't want to totally give that up. Although that, you know, things like that are very much, you know, surprise, surprise. We tend to bring in people who are remarkably like us, so it, it doesn't add to diversity. Um, I wanted to mention a couple of things before I forget about it, uh, and then I've got a couple more questions still. Um, one is, you know, I'm sort of assuming we're all on this call accepting the, the fact that the business case for diversity and inclusion is clear. I think it is at this point. And I, a few years ago at, at a SIPA conference, I put together a presentation that I spent a lot of time on and working with friends that I know or that are consultants in the field. 
looking at the research and the data. I think it's pretty conclusive. Um, if it's helpful at all, I think I put that link in the description somewhere, but I'll, I'm going to share that, I guess, in the general channel is the channel to continue this conversation. But if that can be useful for you in, in, in your organization, great. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention is Renewed is, is basically here to support industry activities, but we did call out specifically, if you look on the website in our documentation, we call out specifically promoting and supporting diversity and inclusion efforts both within companies and within the industry as, as, a, as a good thing for co our companies and our industry and as well as the right thing to do. Um, we've been criticized only by one person about it so far, um, but uh, you know, I, we, 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 we think that's an important, needs to be an important part of this. And, and a little bit goes back to Dan sort of talking about, you know, if, if the messaging is constantly there about this is the right thing to do, this is the good thing to do to support your business, um, you know, so, that, so that's why we made that clear. So we talked about recruiting people into your organization and making that diverse. So that's about the diversity issue within the organization. Uh, and Macy, I'm going to start with you because you sounds like you've done a nice job at the inclusiveness piece, which is you know making that mix work and getting women at least up into into upper levels. Uh, it sounds like you you've got more things you do, but you know how do we how do we make it work within the organization that you know, there's representation throughout the organization, not just, you know, all, all the custodians in the office are the, all the Hispanics in the office are the custodians, uh, that kind of thing, which unfortunately is the diversity that you see in many companies. Yeah, I, I won't um, take too much credit for the, the diversity in terms of women in management. I mean, we have some very strong women in our company and we have a CEO who happens to be a white male, but he's very inclusive. And so those two things together, um, were, nothing was going to prevent the promotion of certain women <laughs> who do their job incredibly well. And, and we do have an environment that, that recognizes performance. We have not, I'll be completely honest, we have not done well in bringing along uh, people of color into senior management roles. And part of it is we just don't have the, the people in the candidate pools for, for new positions, but we also haven't been good at retaining people long enough for them to be promoted into higher level positions. And we're not quite at the bottom with <laughs> custodial or, or, but we do have a, a lot of people of color in our accounting departments and our client services departments versus um, publishers, show directors and, and chief editors. We have some, but, but not, not enough. And so it, I think our company has to do a better job at inclusion. And, and this kind of came up when Monta was speaking earlier, you know, the, the whole idea that people have to see the company as a place where they can be themselves. And so it's one thing to hire somebody, but to retain them because they feel it's the place they can grow their career and, and that they're heard, they're celebrated, they're respected, they're recognized for who they are and their differences. And, and that is something that I think the more people of color you have, then a person of color comes in and feels more comfortable. I mean, I think there's a book you know, why do all the black kids sit together in the cafeteria? And there, there, there are a lot of studies on this that people gravitate toward people that are like them. And um, I will add one final point. I know I've been blathering on for a bit, but I had a, uh, an HR manager on my team in, in our Rockville, Maryland office who was a black woman and she was a great HR manager, but during her time with us, she, and she's she's left us, but she we hired more people of color while she was our HR manager than at any other time. And I will say that all my other HR people have the same goals, but I do think that a candidate seeing a, a person of color in a, in a highly respected position, it made them think this is a place I want to be. And so I think that is a part of, you know, I think to your question, Ed, you know, you have to get people in the senior management for other people to see that there's a career path 
for me, whether you're a woman or a person of color or anybody. Yeah, yep. Um, Mamta, what, what, what about you within the organization? You know, how do you, how do you make it inclusive at, throughout the levels of the company? I think it's, you know, as I was saying earlier, I think the fact that we um, seem to know more about each other helps a lot, <laughs> which, you know, which I hope didn't come over too creepy, but it did, um, you know, it's a case of understanding context much better, you know, when you can see, when, you, when you're encouraged to bring some of your home life to work. I, I think that, but it, it's a very passive way of having done it. And I, I completely agree with Macy about the need to do more to retain um, people to, create leadership tracks that are much more obvious to them to support them along that. I mean, I think it just feels that these people are coming and the more people of color you've got in your organization, the more momentum there will be and soon this won't be a problem, you know? So, but it, it, right now it, it, you need a, quite a thick skin to approach an organization that's purely white, mainly white, all male board, mainly white board, you know, whatever, whichever way you look at it and to think I'll fit in there. So, there are going to be those questions being asked by each person. And I think if they can see that there are genuine, you know, if the job advert for a start has genuine messaging around this, it's authentic, um, that they can see that there are, you know, there are people in the company like them, that um, there are retention programs, there are leadership tracks, you know, it, it, it all sort of fits together to really understand whether that company is somewhere you might do well. So, yeah. mm. Dan, Dan, any, anything you're, you're doing that's, that's working well? Uh, yeah, you know, look, I, I think the, the culture of an organization uh, comes from, you know, the, sort of the, the, uh, the people that make up the organization as well as the, the leadership at the top. I, you know, I, we have a, uh, a, I think, a very open and inclusive culture at Money Media. I'm sure we can improve, but, you know, that hasn't been cited as one of the, you know, as sort of a, a problem. When I think about bringing uh, people into the organization, we've made a number of, of, of steps that I sort of outlined earlier that are working. Part of part, in, to some degree, is, is moving people up the ranks, uh, you know, because that takes time. Uh, you, you know, as we have positions that open up, uh, you know, if, if you think about moving people into senior level positions so that there are, are, are people of color and women that are, that are visible in senior level positions, that takes time. You, you can't do that in 12 months. I mean, that's like a three and five year endeavor. Um, and part of the reason is because, you know, there's a pretty big risk hiring someone from the outside for a very senior level position. You know, from what I've seen, the people that usually get the senior level positions are people that have spent a decade or longer in the business. They're steeped in the business operations. They know the brand really well. They have internal networks that help them get things done and be highly effective. And they've been waiting, you know, and, and they're, they've been waiting and position themselves. And if you don't give them the opportunity when it arises, uh, they're likely to leave and go, you know, go to your competitor or you're going to lose that talent in some way. Um, you know, so, you know, what, what I've learned is you have to build a pipeline of talent and, and it takes time, but you've got to start building today, you know, or yesterday, because it's going to take five years or longer before you can really see this group matriculate up into your management and, and senior management ranks. You know, we, I think we, you know, because of where we were five and, and, and so years ago, we have good representation of, of women in our management team and our senior management team. That is probably, it's 50-50 in the senior management team and probably like 60-40 or 55, 45 at the management level. Um, in terms of people of color, it's actually better in the senior management team. It's like, you know, two of six. So it's like one third at the senior management level. Uh, at the management level, it's, it's, it's too low and we de definitely need to improve. We're probably at like, uh, you know, people you know, of, of color sort of as a group combined, you know, 20%, um, you know, and it needs, it needs to probably be somewhere, you know, in the range of double that. So. Uh, but we've brought in, you know, a lot of talented people over the, the past few years, and you know they're performing well, and it's going to it's going to happen over the course of time. Uh, but it does it does take time, and and that's that's one of the challenges, I think. Yeah, and 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 Vic, Victoria mentioned, and uh, yeah, Mamta referred to it earlier. The you know where we're where we're located certainly has a big impact on this. I, I'm I'm 
we're located, we're a small company located in a predominantly white area with a little bit of Latino, but not much. And, uh, and then we're in the stock, the investing industry, which is among the most white male industries you can find. And so trying, to, you know, I'm constantly networking, trying to find people, even uh, as you, as people know who are connected with me on LinkedIn or even, or Facebook, people with experience or even an interest in stock investing. Uh, I, I do happen to know, I, I know a lot of, I have a good network of friends of color and friends in the HR and um, and and diversity communities who have given me a lot of, lots of places to look, but it's really really hard to do this uh, to find people and uh, and attract them and uh, you know so I I do think the remote the capability of remote work uh, makes it easier because now we, you know we're not so much fishing just in the local pond here and I think that helps. We're not in a position to move a lot of people around the country. So, um, uh, so but but now that now that people can be working remotely, that certainly helps. Um, we have about ten minutes left. I've got a, f a few more questions, but I wanted to pause and see you know if there are people on the call here who had uh, questions for our panelists or experiences or insights they wanted to, wanted to share. A lot of people don't hire any cats at all. Uh, so, you know, I think uh, that's one, been one big issue as an industry. Um, so, uh, yeah, if, do, do people have any other questions they want to throw out or, or comments about experiences you've had uh, in your organizations? Um, well, I put a comment in the chat earlier, which I thought was interesting uh, related to um, uh, diversity, not just internally, but with events and participation. Oh. Does anybody have diversity or benchmarks or goals or thoughts around um, for uh, your your, con your people consuming your product? So, so think things I, gen I assume like like you know at least fifty percent of our keynote speakers need to be women or or exactly yeah. Uh, no, no panel without, you know, no all white male panels kind of thing. Yeah, um, we don't really have like, at least in my groups, like I don't have those benchmarks. Each of my show directors try to, to get what they can. But I was just wondering if there's like industry benchmarks out there, because that would be a good thing for them to strive towards, right? Like, yeah. I mean, I and you certainly hear about more and more companies saying, our people can't be on a panel that's all white male, or they can't be on a program that that you know has doesn't have, you know that that has the one token person of color on the whole program or whatever. Um, yeah, Dan. Yeah, the the FT group has uh, that rule. Uh, they call it the no mammal rule. No, you, I, I'm not allowed to participate on a panel of all men, uh, and you know increasingly, uh, or we're moving towards also you know. Having a similar rule for for uh, people of color. Um, also, the the FT Live division is the is the group that I sort of partner with. If I'm going to host a conference, and we hosted the Future of Asset Management conference uh, last month, or yeah, last month. And we really made you know there wasn't a specific rule in place in terms of a percentage or number, uh, but I mean from the beginning. Uh, there was an effort to make sure that we were going to have a, you know, a very diverse lineup uh, of people in, in sort of all, you know, on, on all demographics. And I was, I was impressed, you know, in the, working with the FT Live group, you know, a month, you know, for the conference that took place a month ago and, and the prior year, uh, the, the sort of priority level of, of that, uh, you know, initiative has really risen and they, they did an excellent job. You know, I, I was also saying at some point, look, I'm on board. I agree. We, we've got to do this. But it's going to be challenging because, you know, the investment management industry just, you know, as Ed said earlier, you know, it's not a very diverse group to begin with. But I was amazed at the job they did. I mean, I, I watched the panel. I mean, I watched the program for the full day conference that we hosted. And uh, honestly, it was not representative of the industry. It was representative of what the industry ought to look like. But it was not representative of the actual state of, uh, the, you know, the, right. the core industry that we serve, uh, and, and the, you know, I was yeah impressed that they had done a good job, uh, and, and we supported them in that. But it, it was, 
you know, it, it is a, a huge initiative and priority for us. That, yeah, that is, that is an interesting note. I mean, I think about that even like at, at you know, at SIPA conferences or things where um, you, you it, it's you, it's not enough to be representative of your industry. You have to be representative of what your industry should be looking like, um, which can be very hard. Uh, you know, going back again to our situation, and I'm sure you get this to some extent too, Dan, being in your industry. But um, you know, the the candidates that are great in the investing world, well, Schwab has diversity efforts too, and and Bank of America and American Express and all of these huge companies are wooing, are, are going after the same diverse candidates that we are, and uh, it, it's it very hard to compete with that. So, um, and and the only thing I can think to do is I just have to get out and make grassroots efforts and get people who who aren't getting sucked into that um, and also be ready and willing to train people. But uh, so um, Monta or, or Macy, any, anything further on the, uh, in response to Jen's thought about, about, you know, diverse programming and, you know, the external diversity face. Well, I liked her question and I think it's, it's really pertinent. I think when I spoke at the subscribe event a couple of weeks ago, the same thing came up and I think we, if we don't have those benchmarks, maybe we need to invent them. You know, I think this is a really good time and place to start creating um, sector-wide benchmarks in the events in the journalism space. We don't have them, so why don't we set them up, you know, and get everyone measuring, um, tracking progress, setting good targets. You know, I think this is something that's really necessary right now because we're all looking at ways to improve. Yeah. And... Macy, I'm going to give you the last word and then we're going to wrap up. The only thing to add to that, I and mean, we have not, as Jen points out, looked at benchmarks for the community that our products are serving, but we do have a subcommittee on our diversity and inclusion committee focused solely on speaker so that we can start to spread throughout the company the best practices in getting diverse speaker panels. And most of the people on that committee are content programmers for our events. So we've sort of focused on that as a start. Yeah. Well, that's and Ed, could I just make a comment on what Matma said about um, building, you know, building our own benchmarks with, with the, um, uh, re, uh, I hate to say resurgence, but with the extra emphasis that's being placed now on di diversity and inclusion, we are getting a lot of inbound from our sponsors saying, we want to know what your plan is for diversity. We want, you know, so it's, mm. it is not going to be optional. It's, you know, business is going to dictate that we are going to do better and get more of our sponsors mind share and wallet share. If we lead, it will be better for our business. And so I think it's going to quickly become a business imperative, not just a nice, hey, look, we're, we're, we're diverse. Um, but if you can't demonstrate that you're taking steps in that direction, I think it's gonna start to hurt your business. And so I would really encourage anybody that is um, hosting even conferences that have sponsorships to, to really start to pay attention so that you've got something when the sponsor comes to you that you can say, yeah, here's, here's what we're doing. I, I don't know that it has to be, you know, that you have to be 100% there, but I think you've got to be able to demonstrate that you've thought about it and that you have a plan. Yep. And don't show them a brochure with all white men sitting in pictures. Because I'm always like, put a woman in there, put somebody in a wheelchair in there, fix the marketing so it doesn't look like right. all the same. Yeah, no, that, that's a great point, Jen and, and Heather. Uh, it, it is... I, I mean, I think the, and I know you were in that session I did a few years back. I think the 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 case is is clear just on the fact that companies make better decisions. They they close sales better. They create better better products when they have more diverse uh, diversity of thought, true diversity of thought. Going back to Dan, your comments earlier, uh, you know real diversity of perspectives but on top of that now you're going to have trouble lining up speakers because they're not going to participate you're going to have trouble lining up sponsors because they're not going to want to participate it's the business imperative just keeps keeps growing and growing um 
I think this is a really important conversation and I'm so delighted to have been part of it today. Uh, I didn't neglect it to mention at the beginning, which I should have, I apologize. We are recording this and, you know, I, th I think we've had a great group here and I know we've lost a few people, um, but, uh, but still there's so many more people. And so we're, you know, we'll push the recording of this. Uh, you know, this may not be the last program we ever do on this topic, but, but I think, I think this is something I would definitely love to share with more people because I think they would get a lot out of this. Uh, I want to thank Mamta and Macy and Dan. Uh, you've added an enormous amount. And you know what? There aren't many experts here in the, in the corporate practitioner world. Um, a lot of people are figuring this out. And, you know, it, 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 we're, we're going to get there in increments. And I think conversations like this are a really important part of that. Uh, so thank you for that. I know uh, the amazing Stephanie Williford has already put out the uh, poll on this meeting. So thanks for that. And I want to mention that uh, coming up in November, we have some great program. We, we, we've got our content roundtable on uh, November 10th. We've got the marketing roundtable on November 12th, the events roundtable on uh, November 18th. And then we have got a session on customer engagement with Andy Baker uh, before, before David uh, in, on November 19th. And then November 26th, David with his on the offense uh, sessions, which have been phenomenal. Um, so uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you again to our great panelists and uh, we will see you uh, down the road. And oh, and the other thing, uh, uh, the conversation, if we want to continue the conversation, we'll do it in the general channel on Slack. I couldn't find any, didn't see anything that seemed more appropriate. And frankly, then it's going to get to more people and maybe help grow awareness because uh, I think that's an important part of this. Uh, seeing people, industry leaders talking about this in public places creates the sense that this is important. So we'll continue the conversation there. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.